Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, we've just got out of Syria with my colleagues, Tom Walker and Soren Monk, where we've been following how Syrian army forces have been pressuring IS and, of course, American-backed forces have been pushing at them towards Raqqa as well. In Iraq, the second city, Mosul, has fallen, although there are still Islamic State forces in that country. So where are they and how strong are they? Our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman, reports. This morning, western Mosul was still being pounded by coalition airstrikes. The Americans claiming a handful of ISIS militants are still holding out in the old city. The UN says some 3,000 civilians are still trapped in this wasteland. It's feared that such airstrikes may have killed hundreds in the last few months. Amnesty International describing the conflict as a civilian catastrophe. But beyond the old city last night, Iraqis were celebrating. At least 700,000 of them have been forced from their homes. Entire neighborhoods are in ruins. Their ISIS has almost disappeared, and these townspeople are no longer being used as human shields. As for Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who declared his so-called caliphate in Mosul three years ago, well, one ISIS group said today that he's dead, while another faction insisted that he isn't. And that has reportedly sparked factional infighting between ISIS militants after their leader's death was announced here in the Iraqi town of Talafar. Though given how invisible Baghdadi was for years, his death arguably won't make much difference on the battlefield. Uh, we've heard all kinds of reporting that he's alive, that he's dead. Quite honestly, don't know. Hope he's deader than a doornail. If he's not, as soon as we find out where he is, he will be. So who controls what in the two main battlegrounds with ISIS? In Syria, the government and its allies control most of the west of the country, the Iraqi government, central and southern Iraq. In Syria, Arab rebel groups fighting the government are concentrated in the north and southwest, while Kurdish groups control most of the north of both countries. As for ISIS, well, in Syria, the group is now being pushed out of Raqqa and it's concentrated around 10 desert towns, mostly along the Euphrates River and near the government outpost of Deir Ezzor. In Iraq, ISIS are in the desert around al Qaim, again in the Euphrates Valley, along with the towns of Talafar, west of Mosul, and Hawija, south of Kirkuk. Are ISIS's days numbered? I think they are numbered as a terrestrial caliphate, as they call it, yes, but I don't think they're numbered as an organization, and certainly not as an idea. I think they managed to tap into a sort of wellspring of discontent among the Sunni population in both sides of the Iraq-Syria border, uh, which is not likely to go away anytime soon. In fact, a lot of the work against Islamic State may have made the situation for Sunnis in those areas even worse. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, in Iraq, you have what, three, maybe four million uh, displaced people uh, who don't actually have any homes to go back to. If you look at pictures of Mosul now, there's not a lot left standing. However improbable it sounds, some Sunni Arabs may even grow nostalgic for ISIS amid these ruins. That depends on whether they can build a better Iraq if and when the fighting ends. These airstrikes on Mosul today a reminder that talk of victory against jihadists has often proved premature. So that's the big picture, but how does it happen on the ground at a micro level? Now, we've just returned from Syria, where we've been spending time with an elite unit of Syrian army forces called the Tiger Forces. They originated in Air Force Intelligence and get their pick of the army. And we spend the day watching them and meeting their commanding officer. Swooping over the countryside of Eastern Hammer, the jet could be piloted by a Syrian or Russian. Either way, it's hitting Islamic State positions on one of the most deadly front lines in the country. 
We are watching from the edge of a town that has suffered terribly at the hands of ISIS. Two months ago, Islamic State militants came in from their positions just over that horizon to this town of Akareb. But instead of attacking the Syrian army, they went into civilian homes. Syrian soldiers came to fight them off, but more than 50 people, troops, civilians and militants, were reported killed that morning. The man leading the ground war against Islamic State here is Colonel Samer Yassin of the Tiger Forces. Formed a year and a half ago by officers in Air Force Intelligence, they get their pick of Syrian army for frontline offensive missions. The men here regularly fight Islamic State at close quarters, saying the militants attack this position at night. The colonel is keen to show us how he deals with unwanted visitors. Tell me about these men, why are they the elite? The colonel takes us further into his sector, where IS suicide attacks targeted his men and where they hit back. As we reach the artillery position, they've been targeting what used to be a school. They suspect it's being used to traffic weapons to Islamic State. The first strike misses, so they reload, and the colonel orders an adjustment. This time, it's a direct hit. But before they can celebrate, a forward controller on the ground radios in an urgent new target. They've had a mortar attack from the ISIS side over there, so they're getting this gun ready to fire back. The target is four kilometers away, and it takes about 90 seconds between radio report and tank gun being loaded. The soldiers get five days off from their life here every month. What is it like for you living, living like this in a camp uh, with just your, your comrades? Back at his base, Colonel Samer has collected a range of trophies seized from IS militants. This car had 486 trophies. And inside his office, he shows us the horrific videos taken by his forces after they've destroyed Islamic State positions. But besides this, the colonel's side has also retaken Syrian cities in a war that has claimed an estimated 400,000 lives in six years. Colonel, for many years there have been some terrible images coming out of Syria, from Homs, from Aleppo, of destroyed cities and of people being killed. Is this what you joined the army to do? And there are more cities yet to take in this war. But as the situation moves fast, the Tigers and their colonel are waiting to hear where they'll be sent next. Well, with me now is the author and journalist Rania Abu Zaid, one of the authorities on Syria and the only journalist to get to the rebel-held Idlib 
city. Um, it's tempting right now, with Mosul and Raqqa about to fall, it seems, to think, well, it's all over for Islamic State. I mean, how far away are we from that point? Islamic State is merely the latest incarnation of a group that we have seen many times before since 2003. I remember being in Mosul in 2008 and 2009 embedded with the US military watching them kick in doors trying to defeat the precursor to Islamic State. So certainly the group's territorial uh, losses as its caliphate, so-called caliphate shrinks, is symbolic and it is important but the group will merely uh, revert back to becoming vintage Islamic State of Iraq with things like sleeper cells, uh, with things like, you know, a, a more conventional sort of guerrilla force. And, you know, we're already seeing that in parts of Idlib, for example, where in the past 24 hours, dozens of alleged uh, Islamic State sleeper cells have been picked up. So do you think you, there's going to be a sort of a merging between what's happening in Idlib, where there is this range of rebel groups and, and, and Jabhat al-Nusra uh, and, and, and Islamic State, that this will all end up sort of merging into one terrible thing. There are very different drivers for what, for Islamic State in Syria and in Iraq and there are very different reasons for the group's rise in both countries and until those uh, until that is uh, you know each country is considered separately and the drivers are considered separately you can't sort of speak about um, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Islamic State in Iraq rose for particular reasons and in Syria that it had very different reasons. In, in Syria, when you're with the Syrian army, they talk about Islamic State as all foreigners. You know, it's nothing to do with Syria. Is that true? No, it's not true. It's not true because I know members of Islamic State that are Syrians. Um, you know, the Islamic State in Syria exploited the Syrian uprising to, to gain a foothold in a country that didn't even have Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it's, it's very different and I think it's very easy to sort of dehumanize the group and especially if you're with the Syrian army and claim that there are no Syrians in this group, wh whereas in fact there are. But on that point, I mean, even, uh, you know, there's a reason why uh, Islamic State is only in the eastern parts of Syria and that's because in 2014, rebel groups, a whole, you know, across the spectrum of, of, of rebel groups from Free Syrian Army to Jabhat al-Nusra, which was the Al-Qaeda affiliate, kicked them out of three provinces within the span of days in 2014. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complicated picture. And we're a very long way from it being over. I, unfortunately, yes. Rani Abzeh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, that's it uh, from our series of reports from Syria. Now back to London. Thanks, Krish.